I can't leave. I'm just saying, like... You've started something. Uh, no. All right. Limitations on women. Next, look at that limitation on women. Uh, right. <laughs> Though this period provided more options for women, there were still many restrictions. So though this period post-Reformation provided more options for women, there were still many restrictions. Single women might have been able to choose to live outside a convent, but they couldn't serve as preachers. So they might be able to like, work and live outside of a convent and be religious educators, but they couldn't be a preacher. And they couldn't hold positions of authority in the church either. That's still the case in a lot of churches now. Like There's a lot of women who cannot hold positions in a, of authority in a church. Instead, they had to serve as models of obedience and Christian charity. What? It should be a model for Christianity. So they had to be. They had to serve as a model of obedience or Christian charity. They were also mostly expected to be quiet. Are you trying to say something? I'm not trying to say anything. I'm trying to say how the tides have turned. How the tides have turned. Alright, uh, one exception were the Anabaptists, that's one exception for Protestant groups. Uh, this was one of the least patriarchal societies outside of, like Catholics, Lutherans, and Calvinists. Within the Anabaptist groupings, women did hold leadership positions and could be preachers. That's why we had to go kill them. <laughs> that's why they had to go run them all up into Munster, Germany and slay them. They led worship, taught scriptures, and regarded and were regarded as church elders. I think Ethan, correct me if I'm wrong. I think the Methodist Church just had like the first few. Yeah, they have female I mean, preachers now. So. But like, it was like recent that they had yeah. the first. But like, like Baptist Church doesn't have them. At least not Southern Baptist anyway. Uh, Catholic Church doesn't have them. Probably Lutheran, not only Lutheran does either. Yeah, Methodist is very different. Methodist, I remember the show. Episcopalian has them. Episcopalian has females. I know. Yeah. All right. <laughs> All right. Move along. Marriage and childbirth. This slide looks dusty. Yeah, I'm, I'm, this is part of the redesign. I'm struggling through getting everything done right now. Um, all right, marriage and childbirth. So the 1300s were hard on population because of the plague and famine and those kind of issues. So, and that's also the start of the Little Ice Age. So the 1300s was a hard time for population growth in, the thir in that time period. 15, 1600s got a little bit better. So 15, 1600s began to recuperate after the plague. We mentioned this before, like Europe basically by the mid 1500s is back to pre-plague levels. Like for example, France doubles from the mid 1400s to the mid 1500s, France doubles in size from 10 to 20 million people. So France doubles in size from 10 to 20 million people from the mid 1400s to the mid 1500s. Um, but Europe depends on population growth to make economic growth happen. So they had to have population growth to make economic growth happen. Growth also meant farmers and artisans had greater incentive to bring more food and other essentials to market. So with, so basically you need a bigger population so that way farmers can make money as well as so as uh, artisans or people in cities can make goods that they can sell. So population growth was key to economic growth as well. But as we've been talking about, population growth also affects marriages. So population growth also affects marriages as well too and marriage patterns. So like 13, 1400s, people were marrying not based on love or compassion, but more based on economic reasons like renting a farm or having children. So early on in the, in the modern period, like 13, 14, early 1500s, they were marrying less based on love and compassion, more based on like economic arrangements, where they, you know, it would help run a farm together or help have children together. So we're going to look at some strains and how they affect marriages and childbirth as well, too. Um, first, with harsh winters and poor harvest. So one of, the, one of the big effects on population growth was Little Ice Age in the 1300s. It starts in the 1300s. There's a series of unusual harsh winters that led to poor harvest. Um, 
in the 1600s. So we mentioned this way back when, that like basically the Little Ice Age starts in the 1300s, but it, it has its worst period around when? Early 1600s. One of the reasons why you lead into what war? 30 years. 30 years war, right? So scarcity of food in the early 1600s led to malnutrition and disease. Scarcity of food in the early 1600s led to malnutrition and disease. To cope with poverty, the agricultural class started to have smaller families, or even delay marriage. So a lot of times in that early 1600s period, with the Little Ice Age being in its worst period and in like in increasing famine, um, a lot of families would, in that time, have fewer kids or not get married at all because of the uncertainty of living. They waited until they could become financially established before they married, and would therefore marry at a later age. So kind of effect here that's starting to take place in the early 1600s is that they're, they're delaying marriage, marrying ages to later on. So, especially in West Europe. West Europe was delaying marriages to like later 20s. Right. So they're delaying marriages until later 20s in mostly Western Europe because it was hard to be financially stable earlier on with all the bad harvest and stuff. Does that make sense? Okay. So that pattern then restrained population growth. So you do kind of have a population, and we mentioned this before too, that like in the first half of the 1600s there was kind of a population plateau where just things kind of remained stagnant for a while. It's also because 30 years war is like killing everybody in Europe too. Um, but it's not until like later on that you're going to have big population growth like after the mid 1600s. You also have the decline of multi-generational households. You also have the decline of multi-generational households too. While once very common to find several generations of one family living in the same household, this practice became increasingly less common in West Europe. So in the 14-1500s, the practice of having multi-generational families, like having you know grandma, aunts, uncles, cousins, your mom, dad, children, all that living in the same household, that begins to decline, and you go to more just what living in the household? The nuclear family, right? And there you go. 